Hello everyone, and welcome to The Disciples Defense, with your host, Sir Justin. This podcast will be dedicated to discovering life's toughest questions on faith, science, philosophy, and much more. And join him on this treacherous yet fulfilling conquest. Christ is king, and let the battle begin. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first official episode of The Disciples Defense. This should be a really interesting episode. This one will be covering, of all religions, why Christianity, right? I could have chosen any number of different religions or be a religious i could have been an atheist or agnostic but why did i why did i fall under christianity why did i think that that one was actually the one that was true and i think this is going to be a really interesting discussion uh, i'm not going to go into too much depth of each specific religion today i'm just going to gloss over most of them but i'm going to make fundamental reasons as to why i had big objections to those ones but then later on, throughout other podcasts, I will get a lot more specific. So before anyone from these religions starts to send me a bunch of hate mail, um, actually, you can go ahead and I'd love to hear your criticisms. But I will go into depth for each of these religions on a later episode. And then I can give you further objections as to what I have with these different religions. But for now, I'm going to give you guys a basic rundown as to why I believe that Christianity is the true religion. And it is the true belief. So joining me today is a good friend of mine, William Cook. Yo. I'm sure a lot of you guys know him. <laughs> um, he's a good friend Probably. of mine. Uh, I've known him my entire life. We have really deep, interesting conversations about a lot of different topics. Um, a lot of it being religion, a lot of it being philosophy, politics. And we have really interesting discussions. We talk about really troubling questions that we have. And I think it's really good that I've been able to find a friend like this. Um, for you guys out there listening and girls... I think it's really important to have at least one person that you can have these really interesting discussions with. Yeah, and someone that's just as interested because that's what having these kind of conversations, I think, is what helps you grow. It's like if you just have these uh, thoughts and ideas and they just sit there in your head and you're not getting them out there, you're not talking about them, you're not hashing them out, then it's almost like you're stagnant in a way, I guess. Yeah. Like you can expose your ideas to people on the internet i guess that's the really only way you could do it if you don't have friends that are into but that kind of how, thing how how well does that work <laughs> hashing out ideas over facebook i mean not really well but it's, it's not like, ideal that's fair but like where i got all my ideas from initially was from the internet from people online okay so it's like you know people like ben Shapiro, jordan peterson ravi zacharias mm -hmm. all those people um it's like that's where i that's what started me off mm -hmm. into thinking about like deep intellectual things and then it's just like taking my ideas that I previously had uh, from the past, from wherever, and exposing them to that and seeing if they stood up. Mm -hmm. So, And I know uh, I'll speak for myself here, and I, I'm sure you can echo it, is that I've had rough patches in my faith where I was really doubting at all whether or not this was true. And what help, helped me get back besides prayer and actually reading the scripture, which of course is going to help because that is the truth, is um, talking about this with other believers and other people going through these things. And I think something, um, just to stay on this topic of just of a friendship, that I think is really important that you guys need to understand is if you do have friends, be honest with them. Honestly, that, that really helps. Like, don't hold back. There are things that you might have gone through that you're like, you know what, I don't think this person would understand. This person probably hasn't gone through this. Especially as guys, there's a lot of things like, oh, you know, I don't want to... I don't want to look the, the bad one out. I don't want to look weird. I don't want to talk about it. But trust me, as soon as you do, it's like, oh, what do you know? There are other people my age also going through the same things that I am. And it, it builds another layer to a friendship, especially as Christians. I think not only that, but we, we're, we are to hold each other accountable. And we want to build each other in our faith and, and grow more. And I think the only way you can really do that is when you're honest with each other. I'm still on the fence about whether or not I think... Every Christian should have some intellectual side of them. So every Christian should have these conversations uh, to some degree or whether or not it's okay for some Christians just to not do it. Like, I'm really not sure. 
Mm -hmm. uh, what my head tells me is that, yeah, everyone needs to be educated. Everyone needs to think about these things. Everyone needs to hash out these ideas and argue and debate uh, to grow. But honestly, it's like I haven't seen where – I've seen where if too many people don't do it, where it can become a problem. But right. I haven't seen where if some people do and some people don't, it's like it doesn't seem to have really big impact in the world. Um, it seems that pe some people can get along perfectly fine with just the spiritual side of it. I don't know. What do you think? Well, that might be true that they get along perfectly fine. But once again, is what they're getting along with and is it what they're following the ultimate mm -hmm. truth of what God wants for us? Mm -hmm. Now, it might be that uh, there are a lot of people that live in this. I don't want to say like an echo chamber, but it technically is. Like they, they have their beliefs and they're not hashing them out with each other. And I think that it can actually lead to issues. Because mm -hmm. the more people are apathetic towards talking about these things, I think the worse things can get because you won't you won't realize what's right or wrong because you're not thinking about it. Now, you might be thinking about it yourself, but if I, I think if you're not teaming up with other believers, and not even just other believers, but having these discussions with other people and having having those ideas out there needs to happen, I think. I think if you don't have those ideas out there, like if there's a lot of things that I've like if we didn't, well, I was going to say if we don't have the Bible, but if we didn't even have the people discussing the Bible, if there was no such thing as pastors or leaders in the church or or professors like the guy we like, Jordan Peterson, if these guys weren't discussing these things, not only would the audience be so much smaller, but I think a lot of people have trouble understanding the Bible themselves. And when it's broken down for them in ways that they can understand through people like preachers and people mm -hmm. discussing these things, I think it... I, I wouldn't know how extremely fundamental it is, but I'd say it's pretty fundamental. Yeah, and I don't know, like I said, if it's important. I, I'm still not sure if it's important for everyone to be some okay, degree yeah. intellectual. Right. But I would say that there's definitely a problem. A problem arises when not enough people are because mm -hmm. uh, I think especially what's happening in churches today is that there are just so few of them that – uh, when kids they start to grow up and they start to ask questions, people don't have answers to those questions. Right. And if they don't uh, discover people that are able to rationalize through through their questions and and through them exploring the world, then they tend to turn away from Christianity. Yeah. And the rough yeah. patches in my life with my faith, that's exactly what happened. It's just no one had any answers for me. That's and interesting that we have that connection with yeah. uh, where we kind of went away a bit. And so yeah, and so weirdly enough, as online is where I found uh, answers to my questions, or where I found that people. It's not even just answers to my questions. Like there are some questions where people just say, I don't know. But they said, I don't know. And I think that's right. important. Or, or it's just people choosing. What really made the difference is people acknowledging the question right. instead of shutting it down. Mm -hmm. um, and not that I haven't had people that haven't been able to answer the question, not acknowledge it before. But usually it just becomes something in the background that's not important. I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of that yeah. where it's just because, well, we don't really, I don't know, but I, I haven't really thought about it and whatever. Where it's like people online, like uh, Robbie Zacharias, Jordan Peterson, uh, who was that one guy that started that podcast that you really enjoyed listening to? Sorry. Justin Brierley? Yeah, that guy. Yeah. It's just like they'll address it and they'll address it. They'll let you know they've given a lot of thought to it. You can tell mm -hmm. these people like to think about these things and they think they're important questions. And so they're mm -hmm. acknowledging, acknowledging it, even though they know that they might not ever get to the truth of it. Right. It's like I think that's so important. So – and I do want to – I do think a very humbling thing that I actually learned from uh, a good friend of mine who's a pastor is uh, I remember asking him a question one day. Um, I don't actually remember the exact question I asked, but I asked them the question, and they responded with, you know what, Justin? I don't fully know the truth to that question. And that actually, although on, on the surface that actually might look like I wouldn't enjoy that because I was looking for an answer – but it was hum I was I was humbled by that. I was like, okay, at least I didn't get a fake answer. And I think I have seen some apologists that I've watched. I'm not going to name names, where I've watched them, and they give um, they give an answer, but it didn't actually answer the question that the person was asking. And it's almost I don't know if it's on purpose or not, but I think sometimes if there's a question we're, we're troubled by, we feel like we have to give an answer. As opposed to just saying, you know what, I need to think about that more. That's a really interesting question. Mm. I, I do have that issue sometimes, and I've done it myself. I'm guilty of it, where sometimes I, I haven't humbled myself to just say, you know what, I'm not sure about that question. For sure. And like I think everyone's done that um, at least a few times, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's not uncommon. It's because people uh, 
we have these instincts to well to be prideful and things right so mm. um but yeah that's another big thing too actually i didn't think of that but now what i'm thinking about it now you're right there's been a lot of times where i've asked people uh other christians questions and they just they answer the question away where they dodge the question mm-hmm. and they don't address it and that was a serious issue for me too at the time so mm-hmm. that's interesting um yeah so i, I want to get into the topic for today interesting, interesting. that's a good inter- <laughs> interesting that's very interesting interesting uh, I want to get to the topic for today, which is, uh, of all religions, why Christianity? So, like I said in earlier, uh, I can dive in each one of these religions. They could be their own one to some of these religions, like Islam. I could make it an entire, I don't know, 10-part series on. But for now, I'm just going to brush over some of these things. So, when I was very young, I was obviously raised a Christian, as I said in the uh, my uh, testimony. But I did fall away from the faith for a while because... I had lots of questions that I had unanswered. So at that point in my life, this is the kind of the thought that ran through my mind. I thought, I believe there's a creator. I believe that the earth was not created from time plus matter plus chance. I believe that there was a creator that created me and created the earth. And that's another topic as well. But I want to know, why should I believe Christianity? Why should I believe the faith that I was raised in? I mean, how do I know that this one's true? Of course, the the question an- entered my mind that enters a lot of people's minds from that come here from other countries. They say, well, you're a Christian because you're from North America. You're a Christian because you're from uh, the West of the world. If you were raised in India, you could be, you'd be a Hindu. If you're raised in China, you'd be a Buddhist. If you're raised in the Middle East, you'd be a Muslim. So that's why you're a Christian, because you're raised in this culture. And that's partially true. It could be. Yeah, it does. Ha- it does have a factor because obviously the culture has a big influence on religion. Oh, well, sure. And I mean, the culture of the area, if they're f- if they are a majority a certain religion, there's definitely a higher chance that you will also be that. Of course, I like think if like, if you're in Canada, there's a lo- less li- way less likely chance you'll be a Muslim than you will be a Christian. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if I was born in like India or something like that, I would say I would be very likely to be Hindu or Sikh or something mm-hmm. like that. I don't think as a very high chance of me being a Christian at all if I was born in those parts. Statistically, I'm, it'd be very low. Yeah, I'm very fortunate and blessed to have been born in uh, Western North America where I can be exposed to the ideas and that people That's are That's not illegal encouraged. to have these ideas. Yeah, <laughs> people are encouraged to have these conversations in Western society, although... That's a philosophy that's uh, slowly being discouraged more and more, although that's a topic for a different day. But um, there's still a decent number of people, enough people, I think, to uh, give hope where it's like they're encouraged people to have these conversations mm-hmm. and to talk about these things openly. So Yeah, exactly. But that, that question had entered my mind, and I just thought, well, is that true? Am I just a Christian because I'm in Canada? So I wanted to look in each of these religions, and I thought, okay, well, is that the reason? So I went and I looked at these religions, and this is not a thing that took me a little bit of time. This was years of looking into these things, and uh, I'll give you guys a few pointers as to why I'm not certain religions, and then I'll get into one of the fundamental concepts as to why I am a Christian. So the reason that I could not be a Muslim was uh, a lot, but I'll I'll brush over some of the bigger points. Um, I'd say one of the biggest points for me is that I could not look past the life teachings and words of Muhammad. It was, it was, there was just too much there. There was just too much wrong. There was too much evil. There was too much sin. I could not look past it. The actions and words that he had said, taught through Hadiths, such as like Sahil Bakari, Sahil Muslim, um, and all the other hadiths, as well as the Quran, it, they were just unavoidable, and they're just they're deeply problematic for me. I could not look past them. So I'm I'm not just gonna say that without actually giving you guys um, sources. So here are some of my sources as to why I say that. So here's one: Muhammad commands his followers to kill critics of Islam. Um, so I'm gonna read you guys from Sunan Abu Dawood. That's one of the hadiths of of uh, Islam. As well as you can also read the ninth chapter of the Quran, verse 29 specifically also says it, to uh, kill the Christians and Jews unless they pay their jizya, which is like a tax. Um, but here's Sunan Abu Dawood 4348. Narrated Abdullah ibn Abbas, a blind man had a slave mother who used to abuse the Prophet and disparage him. For those curious, when it mentions the Prophet, that is referring to Muhammad. He forbade her, but she did not stop. 
He rebuked her, but she did not give up her habit. One night, she began to slander the prophet and abuse him. So she took a dagger, placed it on her belly, pressed it, and killed her. A child who came between her legs was smeared with the blood that was there. When the morning came, the prophet was informed about it. He assembled the people and said, I adjure by Allah the man who has done this action, and I adjure, adjure him by right to him that he should stand up. Jumping over the necks of the people and trembling, the man stood up. He sat before the prophet and said, Apostle of Allah, I am her master. She used to abuse you and disparage you. I forbade her, but she did not stop. And I rebuked her, but she did not abandon her habit. I have two sons like pearls from her, and she was my companion. Last night she began to abuse and disparage you, so I took a dagger, placed it on her belly, and pressed it till I killed her. Thereupon the prophet said, O be witness, no retaliation is payable for her blood. Sunan Abu Daud 4349 Narrated Ali ibn Abu Talib A Jewess used to abuse the Prophet and disparage him. A man strangled her till she died. The Apostle of Allah declared that no retaliation was payable for her blood. And then this verse as well. Uh, not, Quran 9 verse 29 And although I know some people might listen to the hadiths that I mentioned and there are certain sects of Islam that will say that that uh, hadith isn't reliable, that hadith isn't reliable. Well, you guys argue about that all the time. And I was reading from your most trusted sources. So there's nothing else you can say about that. Uh, but the Quran 9 verse 29 says, Fight those who do not believe in Allah or in the latter day and who do not forbid what Allah and his messenger have forbidden and who do not adopt Islam. Even if they are people of the book, which would be Jews and Christians, fight until they humbly pay the jizya and have been subdued. So, that was a problem for me. And I've tried to hear some Muslims say, oh, it's not talking about a physical fight. That's talking about a fight of ideas. It's like, uh, I'm sorry, no. That's, no. If they would have, because they always say that the Quran is the true word of God and every single word in there is of, is Allah inspired. If that's true, and they say that not a single word was out of place. If that's true, don't you think he would have said that? He would have said ideas and not just say fight them. And, and obviously, make... the ninth chapter of the Quran, after you do a bit of research, is the most violent chapter in the book. It was the last chapter that Muhammad had written before he died, or had written before he died. And do they also say that the man stabbing the dagger through the woman's stomach is also metaphorical? They probably do. Probably. For that. And it's, like, it's just clearly that it's instructing Muslims to fight and subjugate other people under Islam. Now, does that mean that every Muslim will follow that? No. Of course not. And I think... The vast majority of Western Muslims uh, either interpret that differently or just will not do that. But if you look at the extremist Muslims, I believe they are extreme because they are following their book to the T. And that's what that's the conclusion that they've come mm -hmm. from. So that is one of them. The other main objection that I had, there's sorry, there are many, but another bigger one that I had for Islam is that Allah has no love for unbelievers. Quran 3, verse 31 to 32. Say, O Muhammad, if you love Allah, then follow me. Allah will love you and forgive you your faults. And Allah is forgiving and merciful. Say, obey Allah and the Apostle. But if they turn back, then surely Allah does not love the unbelievers. Quran 30, verse 43 to 45. Then turn thy face straight to the right religion, sorry, straight to the right religion, before there come from Allah the day which cannot be averted, on that day they shall become separated. Whoever disbelieves, he shall be responsible for his disbelief, and whoever does good, they prepare good for their own souls, that he may reward those who believe and do good out of his grace. Surely he does not love the unbelievers. That's interesting. So that's a big difference between Islam and Christianity. Is Obviously with Christianity, fundamental belief is that Love thy neighbors as, sorry, one of the fundamental beliefs of Christianity is that God loves everybody despite the amount of sin you have. You are still a child of God and he loves each and every one of you. He even says while you were in the womb, he knew you. I think that's a big fundamental difference. And it almost feels like I have to obey God, Allah, to a T. And if I don't, he doesn't love me. He doesn't care about me. That's what it. Now, that is me um, interpreting it in my own way, but that's, that's how I interpret that when I read that. So that was a big problem for me when it came to Islam. And, of course, 
I could go into Islam into further depth, but that is for another podcast. I don't know, William, do you have any thoughts about Islam? Uh, That's a very broad <laughs> statement, but are there any points that you could make off what I was talking about? I'm not as well educated on Islam as you are. I will say uh, from the little bit of research I have done and from most information I know about it, I've heard just from you talking about it. Uh, from what I understand, it's just two... Christianity and Islam are two completely opposite philosophies, right? Mm -hmm. Islam is more ruled by legalism and fear, and Christianity is more like try to win the people over by battle of ideas. It's like Jesus, he sat with sinners and ate with them, mm -hmm. and these guys are saying, go kill them. So, I don't know. That's all I really got to say about that. I'm sorry. I'm just not well educated on Islam. No, it's Islam fine. Itself. No, I, I just want to see if you had any other points, but even you're right, and even to that extent, you cannot leave islam if you're in an islamic country you may be killed for it and i know this is anecdotal but nabil qureshi one of the men that i've learned a lot about islam from um he had asked one of his closest friends growing up who was uh, i'm not going to guess a country he's from a middle eastern country and he said uh hey i have a question for you if i were not to live in america if i lived in the middle east would you kill me because i am now a christian and his friend said, uh, I'll get back to you on that. And he's like, oh. Wow. First of all, he hesitated, which is weird. Oh, my goodness. So then he met with him a week later. And he's like, hey, so I have an answer to what you're saying. Yeah, I'd kill you. If you're in another country, I would kill you. And he's like, well, I guess that's a friend that I've lost now. And then Nabil asked another friend of his who was a Muslim. Um, and he asked him the same question. He didn't even hesitate. He said, yes, straight up, I would. Now, once again, this is anecdotal, but I believe that they are following their book to a T. And I don't have the Quran verse in front of me. I'll bring that up in my, in my um, when I look through Islam. Yeah, and well, and people that follow the Quran to a T, they have the higher ground, because yeah. um, it's like, yeah, they're following it. Everyone else that says, well, I mean, you gotta look at it. it's just kind of, I mean, if you, th if you kind of like, you know, tilt your head and squint. Yeah, it's metaphorical, I and mean, then it's just it can like, be interpreted in this okay. way. But it said the word is the word. It's like it, it says, what was it that you said? that they say about the Quran, every word. Every word is perfect. Yeah, and so it's like, it seems pretty literal. It seems mm -hmm. pretty literal to me. And so the people that basically use it word for word, like they're supposed to, like the Quran says to do, they have the higher ground in all of this. Mm -hmm. So I, I, don't, I don't really see how you could reform Islam at all, even if you wanted to. Like, it just seems to be an evil religion run by an evil book. Yeah. I don't know. No, I agree, and I believe, obviously... For some people, they're thinking, I'm getting into dangerous territory here. But this is territory that needs to be talked about. And I have a Muslim friend or two, and I, I would be more than willing to have them on this podcast to share their thoughts on this and, and what they've thought of these verses if they've even heard them. And some of them, are they're not even taught these things. Some of these things, uh, aren't they don't even know about because their imams never taught them to it. A lot mm -hmm. of them, the imams will, imam means teacher. Uh, their teachers either avoid it or... Uh, interpret it in, dif in a different way. And I can say, to be fair, that there are some times where Christian pastors or leaders don't understand verses and interpret it in the wrong way as well. I, I'm not saying that, but I am saying that this is maybe why some Muslims were unaware of these verses mm -hmm. or why they didn't, they don't interpret them correctly. I've actually talked to some Muslim friends that haven't even read the full Quran through, which is odd. Interesting. Yeah. So it's like, at least, I mean, those are almost the only ones that I know, actually. Okay. The ones that I've worked with, I've only worked up a couple of them that have talked openly about the religion. and uh, A lot of them, most of them embrace it very yeah. well because to Muslims, their religion is their whole life. Yeah. Um, which makes sense. And, I mean, it's a huge part of their, I mean, it's like they have so many prayers they have to do every single day. And it's like you can't avoid, if you're a true Muslim, you can't be kind of eh about it. Uh, and you're, step you, into the bathroom if you're in that slippers. culture, it's pretty frowned upon. Got to be exactly like Muhammad. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Try to do it to a T, what Muhammad did. Um, but anyways, moving on from Islam for now, uh, Judaism. So Judaism, obviously, as a Christian, there's a lot that I look at Judaism and think that they get right. Uh, obviously, most of the book of the Torah is also in the Bible. So a lot of their teachings I look at with, uh, yeah, and I say a lot of that, most of that is true. Um, some of the holidays and teachings I've actually learned a lot from because of other pastors uh, that have taught me more about the history of, of Israel. And obviously, even the word Israel itself is struggle with God. 
So the Jews have been struggling with God for such a long time. We look at that every time we read the Bible, we read the Old Testament, you see this different struggles and battles they've gone through. Um, but why am I specifically not following that religion of Judaism? There are two fundamental things. Um, one of them, which I have heard try, Jews try to rebut, I'll let you guys listen to this, and I'll, I'll let you guys see what you think about it, which is Isaiah 52. I know it's a very common thing for Christians to point out, but I think it's, it's in your book. And I, there are many uh, Torahs out there that actually take away this verse. Now, whether or not it's because of the interpretation of it being Christ or not, I'm not sure. But that is weird. Um, my other fundamental reason is also that heaven is not guaranteed to anyone through Judaism, which is also through other faiths like Hinduism and Buddhism. But listen to this. This is from Isaiah 52. So remember, guys, this is the Old Testament. And my understanding of this, I will get to the end. I'll say it at the end, but William, once I read this to you, I want you to tell me who you think this is talking about. Sorry, I said Isaiah 52. Isaiah 53 is what I meant to say. Tell me who you think this is talking about. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, yet we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through our trans for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, I always struggle with this word. The, chasten, the chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Another version of that says, and by his stripes we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to, be, to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due, his grave was assigned with wicked men. Yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he, did, he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him in a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Hmm. Who might that, that be sounds prophesying? Like someone, hang on. He's at the tip of my tongue. Hang on, let me let me figure this out. Okay. It starts off with J. Hang on, something about... Jehoshaphat? Oh, yes. No, that's not it. Hang Justin. On. Ooh. No, that's not it either. No. Sorry. Hang on. Jesus. Whoa. Oh. I wonder, now what would point you to think that this might be prophesying Jesus? Hmm, maybe every word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what I, I literally think that. Like, I couldn't believe it the first time I read that. I was watching a video. Sorry, I'd read this before, but I didn't get the connection. I was watching a video of a former Jew turned Christian, and he was preaching to Jews in, in Jerusalem, and he was showing them this verse. And either one, they didn't know this verse existed, they had never seen it before. Um, they said it doesn't didn't exist, and he the guy pulled out his mini Torah, and he couldn't find it anywhere. Uh, or two, they just didn't make the connection that this was prophesying Jesus. I thought that was so fascinating that they couldn't see it, because I see it written all over this chapter. You can't avoid it. It's like he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. By stripes we are healed. He was led to the grave. 
yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was mm-hmm. there any deceit in his mouth. I, you can't even, there's not a single verse in here that does not point me towards Christ. Yeah, and you kind of have to put two and two together. Like, this in itself doesn't prove that any given person that was born in that era was was the Messiah, but it's like, mm-hmm. no one else has made such a big impact on the world. Like, Jesus And it's not even just here, you impact. can see. It's like, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I don't remember the exact number of times that Jesus um, quoted the Old Testament, but there's so much prophecy in the Old Testament showing Jesus. I'm just showing you one very big mainstream example. You can see it in Daniel. Um, you can see it in Genesis. It's all over the it's all over the Old Testament. Different ways where you can see the prophecy of Jesus coming. I think uh, Jews have a lot right, but I think if you do not see. Isaiah 52 itself, as well as others that I will also get into when I talk about Judaism in one podcast. If you do not see Jesus Christ written all over this chapter, I am I am not sure. That's just what I have noticed, and that's why I personally could not follow the Jewish faith. I've often wondered too, like why it is that a big section of humanity stayed with the the Jewish religion. Because I'm like, I just don't get it. Like mm. they must be in denial. Like why didn't they? It's a good question. It's like well, why they branch off like that. That's interesting. They're That's also God's chosen people, and they will they will have a very fundamental role in this world still. Mm-hmm. Now, um, once again, like I said earlier, like the word Israel is struggle with God. I mean, I'm not sure. If, this is not. I'm not saying that God purposely made it hard for them to see the true reality of Christ, as many Jews and many people even call themselves Jews are actually Christians that are living in Israel. Um, that's a good question, actually. That's a good one we could tackle someday. Mm-hmm. So the last part I want to get to is some of the more poly- polytheistic faiths. That's the word I struggled with last time. Um, so I said that, and I forgot to actually define what that means. I have a question for you. Sure. Um, there are 33 million different Hindu gods. Could you do an episode on every single one of those gods, please? One an episode per long? god? Yeah, 33 million. That's 33 million episodes. So. How... <laughs> Dude, are you kidding me? <laughs> that would take me uh, carry the one four thousand years to do. Hmm. I'm gonna do the math right now. Don't do the math. I'm dude. doing the math. <laughs> what are you doing? Thirty three million divided by four th- do you even know what you're even typing in? <laughs> yeah, thirty three million. Yeah. Okay. Times Times. What do you what are you multiplying? Hang on, I'm trying to figure out how many years it would take. So let's see, you do at least one episode a week. <laughs> <laughs> one episode so there's seventy two weeks in a year, right. I believe. 33 million divided by 72. There we go. So how many how many pod how many podcasts would that be? To do a, a pod why are we even doing this? <laughs> to take a podcast on every single god in Hindu faith, it would take me 458,333 years to do. You know, what? I'm good. I'm a pass for now. I'm going to take a hard pass on that one there, William. Okay. I mean, all right, fine. You know, what? I, it doesn't bother me at all. I mean, I was just really hoping that you'd do that for me as a friend of yours, but you know what? Whatever. All right, uh, it's fine. You're okay. not worth it. You know what? It's not. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> no problem. Okay. So the last one I want to talk about quickly, and William knows a little bit about this, is Hinduism and Buddhism. Now, this one um, is going to be a little bit quicker, but it comes down to a few fundamental things when it comes to these faiths. So I want to say it earlier. So a, mono, a monotheistic faith yep. is any religion— that follows one God. So that would be Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and also Sikhism, which I learned recently. I thought, for some reason, I thought it was polytheistic. But no, it is a monotheistic faith. I was getting confused because they have the 10 gurus that they follow, but those are just more teachers or prophets Mm. as they see it. But they do follow one God. Sikhism, if you guys don't know, is a faith from Punjab um, in India. And if you're living where I am in Winnipeg, you know that there are many, many Sikh people that live here. And I just say, if you ever get close to one of them, ask them about it. Ask them what it is that they follow. What is it that they believe about God? Now, I will say that there are certain cultures that are a little bit more closed off to religion. So you have to really warm up to them. Some other religions. But it's, it's all, I don't even know if it's a religion, William, or if it's just a person. Because there are some people that are just really warm towards talking about religion where other people just aren't. And I think even with Christians, like you can, I found that even a lot of Christians are really closed off about what they believe. So it might not even be the religion. I think it might just be the person. 
that you're talking to, if they if they are wanting to talk about religion or not, their religion. I do hear from a lot of different sources. You. What do you mean? It's so not a religion. Sorry, I, I do hear that Muslims are a lot more open to be talking about their religion because it's such a big part of their lives. That seems true. Where other religions, like I've noticed with the Sikh people that I've met, it's very difficult to make conversations about their religion. Yeah, it's... Do you think it's more because a lot of them follow it for more of a cultural reason? Yes. Or is it because we're not following, we're not meeting the people that are true Sikhs? Well, I've met, I met one incredibly devout Sikh um, who knew some of the who has memorized big swaths of like text from the holy books and there's actually quite a few holy books hmm. as far as i can tell but there's the one big one uh that's actually considered one of the gurus if you ask if you actually ask the sikh people about their gurus they typically or commonly reference them as gods i think it's just a language problem though it could be um yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, they say they have the power of gods, but they're not the main god. Like, there's, they believe in one god, right? Um, and I'm still not sure. Here's something that I've I, I've heard mixed opinions about. I'm still not certain if they think if one big part of the religion is thinking that everyone worships the same god, because I've heard more than one. I, initially, I just thought because I heard some Christians say that too. Some people mm-hmm. claim to be Christian. They're like, yeah, we all worship the same god. We just don't realize it. I have heard that too. That's yeah. a really so good like, topic for well, another day. Well, maybe that's just that a fringe thing that not all mainstream Sikhs believe but I've heard more than one Sikh say that so I'm not actually sure if that's one of the mainstream beliefs right uh, it's hard to say but yeah basically there's 10 gurus one of them is the actual book um, but there is one main god that all the gurus came from and worship and everything like that so mm-hmm. I think uh, the word Sikh uh, it means something like student or whatever okay and uh, one of their main philosophies is to be a student and a servant to humanity, so to help humanity. Hmm. So if they actually have some very interesting traditions that I'm not going to get into because we'd probably go on too far along with the tangent, that they do to practice serving humanity uh, in their culture, and actually do here in Winnipeg. Um, but in Hinduism, that's a trip. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, like I just said, 33 million different gods, and not a, a single Hindu knows all of them. I'm not sure where they come from, they seem to come out of the woodwork. Like, um, they know the main ones. There are some really big ones in Hinduism that everyone seems to know about that they get told as stories as children. Other than that, uh, it's like there's no way you could possibly keep up with them all. So Yeah, but I would say when it comes to Hinduism and Buddhism, Sikhism. my biggest fundamental problem, once again, this is just surface stuff for now, is that your good deeds have to outweigh your bad deeds. And that's also with Islam and Judaism. Mm-hmm. That's the only way that you'll know you'll enter the kingdom, quote unquote, or their version of heaven. Um, and of course, there are things like reincarnation. Um, that's you can you can only enter heaven through multiple good lives, quote unquote, lived through reincarnation. Um, and that is basically going to tie me to my last point as to why Christianity is so different. Because one of the fundamental concepts that separates Christianity from all religions is the gift of salvation. Mm -hmm. And that you cannot find if you don't know whether or not you're going to enter heaven. As soon as you enter heaven, that's when you're going to find out. That gift is given to you through Christ. And we can see that, I mean, all over the New Testament and the Old Testament. But here is just an example from Ephesians 2. This is a very common one that people know. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now walking, sorry, working, in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too were all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, 
not as a result of works, so that anyone, so that no one may boast. Mm -hmm. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk in them. I agree. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, I mean it's 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 right there. Like that was the whole reason that Jesus sent his son. Sorry, that was the whole reason why God sent his son. Now, mm -hmm. another question that uh, I want to get into another day because we're almost at 40 minutes, is uh, why did he have to die? Like, it makes sense to maybe send your son to help us, like, understand what God wants for us. But why did God have to die? And I'll just quickly um, put it in a certain way that will be uh, easy to digest for now. If there a very good way to show love towards somebody, I'd say one of the best ways you can show love towards somebody is sacrifice. And when I say that, I mean if I want to show like a way that William could see that I that I love him as a friend is that I sacrifice time for him. Like if he has to hang out, I'm like, you know what? I'm a bit busy, but yeah, I'll hang out with you. Or um, hey Justin, can can you come help me? I'm moving into a new house. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, I'll do that. I'll rent a U-Haul for you and I'll help you move and I'll help you move furniture. Sacrifice is a good way to show love towards somebody. I'd say it's one of the best ways. Mm -hmm. Um Obviously, you do that a lot with marriage, and you sacrifice a lot of time, and you have to sacrifice things like even money when you have kids. Sacrifice is a good way to show love. Now, what would be the ultimate sacrifice? Literally, your life. So God, although his son was perfect, sacrificed the only perfect person to ever walk on the earth. His entire life, he was killed just to show us the gift of the of salvation the gift that god that jesus gave to us through the cross which is that we can be saved of our sins if we accept that gift i think um me and william were talking uh once just outside of us just outside of a store that we were at and he brought up that point and the way he worded it i thought was just really interesting the way that you worded that like it, that makes that really makes christianity fundamentally different is that gift of salvation yeah, it's almost it's almost too easy, actually. But <laughs> well, it's just it's literally a gift. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He's trying to save everybody, and that's what makes it different. It's like everyone else, like you mentioned, it's either like your good way, your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, and that just doesn't work because you're still responsible for all the bad you did. Mm -hmm. It's like if so, if I do a bunch of horrible, horrible things, I don't have to answer for that, as long as I do a bunch of good things to counter it contract that that doesn't make any sense yeah and like one of the things that one of the things that convinced me that christianity is the right religion out of all of them is that it just works the best for that reason and for a bunch of other reasons too mm -hmm. the way it promotes community and family unit in a way that's just um through compassion and love and just and just the teachings of it it's like islam very violent promotes fear it rules through tyranny it's like that motto doesn't work We've um, tried it. It's been tried, and it's being tried all around the world, right? And what it does, it doesn't mitigate suffering. It increases suffering. It increases pain. It increases death. Christianity mitigates suffering. It mitigates pain and all that thing, all those things. It's like even Hinduism and Sikhism, the two other really big religions in the world, that doesn't work either because, how do I put it? It goes off of that philosophy that we were just talking about. Where it's just your good way, good deeds outweigh your bads, and it's primarily cultural. There's a huge cultural push to believe in those things. You talk to these people; they don't want to convert anyone. Well, they don't believe in evangelism. They don't believe in it. It's so like if you believe it's fundamentally true, don't you want to tell other people about it? And like, no, we won't. We won't do that. Exactly. That's the only way to save people. That's the only way to that's save people. That's not attractive don't you at all. Tell people? No, we don't. We don't care. And you talk to them, and honestly, every single one of them I've asked why they believe what they believe. In the end, when it gets really gets down to it, they'll say, or, okay, I, I can't claim that everyone's going to say this, but these are the ones that they have said, according to my experience. They'll say, well, because my parents expect me to or something like that, or my family tells me to. It's become such a problem uh, in Hindu culture that in India it's become such a problem that people are starting to question things and fall away from the faith of Hinduism that they actually made it illegal to convert from Hinduism to any other culture. 
hmm. to any other religion, sorry. They're trying to protect their religion that desperately. Wow. And that's because I hear people talking about Hinduism and the stories and the main gods in it, and they're just ridiculous. And I ask them, like, how do you think that could ever be possible? Like, even the logic of that doesn't make any sense. It's completely incoherent. And they say, oh, I don't know. I just told that story. I, 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 I just believe because my parents told me to. Mm. And it's just, I think people that begin to question it, they just fall away from it. Mm-hmm. Because there's just no logic in it. And there's no logic in Sikhism either. Well, there's there's more logic in that, I think. Right. Um, but still, it just doesn't hold up. It doesn't hold up as well as Christianity So does, you were getting to the point of why you, why you think Christianity holds more strength than the right. other religions I wanted to you. cover all of those, right? So Islam, Hinduism, Sikhism, Judaism, those models don't work as well. So either they promote suffering or they don't mitigate to, to the degree that Christianity does. Mm-hmm. And so the reason why I believe there is a, a one true religion, the reason why I believe there is a God, I won't get into today. Mm-hmm. Because that's going to go down a different path. Yeah. But I decided that there was a God, that there was a creator, that religion there must be a true religion at some point in my life. And so then I was just figuring out which one was correct. And honestly, I've never seen one that would, works the best and mitigates the most amount of suffering of Christianity. So, so you, like, you would this, say that if there was one, it's most likely that it's Christianity. It Is has that the way to you would be. word it? It has to be. Okay. It has to be. Well, because... No other no other God does it so well. It's like, hey, this is the God I want to worship. Mm-hmm. This must be right. And what does this God say? He says that all the other ones are wrong. I know this is just a saying, but it's an interesting thing to hear. Um, it says, if I'm wrong about God, I wasted my life. If you're wrong about God, you wasted your eternity. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that's just a saying, but it's, it's something to think about. And it's like, yeah, it's the, the way that you worded that was really interesting. How you just think that... The way that Christianity represents the way to live is the highest standard that you can see. The it, best standard mm-hmm. you can see. 100%. I've yeah. never seen any model work so well in the world. In fact, I think that if. I mean, it's created world, Western society, it's helped create Western society. For sure. If the whole world was Christian, the world would be a much, much better place. And people say, well, Christians and even high, big groups of Christians have done horrible things. Yeah, I know. But the thing is, the mechanisms in place for dogma and for not questioning things for not being rational that exists in people all around the world no matter what religion you are people will always do evil things and they, they sometimes they use religion or christianity as a gimmick mm-hmm. or or whatever but you have to look at it if it's taught yeah exactly and when you take a religion away they use something else they'll worship science or they worship the government but the mechanisms that cause people to believe in religion are there in everyone i think or at least most people the 99.99 percent of people and so it's just, if you look at Christianity, the philosophies and the worldviews that govern that, it just works the best. It mitigates the most amount of suffering. And so if you have all those other religions where they come to pre- the predominant religion, I just think things would eventually fall apart or not be nearly as good, not, not mitigate nearly as much suffering or even make it much, much worse, cause more suffering. Mm-hmm. But Christianity, the only one that works this well. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. That's a really interesting perspective. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Very interesting. Interesting. Wow. That's a good point. That's wow. entirely possible. Entirely possible. <laughs> I've never really thought about it quite like William does. And that's why I love having uh, William to talk to about these things is because his outlook is different than mine. Although me and William agree on far more than we disagree on, his outlook is different. And I, that's why I said earlier in the podcast why I think it's so important to have these discussions. And that's why I'm going to be inviting a lot of different people on here because I want to take in all of these things. Because like I said, guys... I'm a 22 year old guy and maybe that's a perspective that's that's good to have out there that's maybe missing I'm not sure um, but you guys will be able to help kind of help me walk through my faith because th- there's no way I'm gonna ever claim that there is that I know a lot like I'm still learning guys like there's still a lot I need to learn I do think I have good concepts for most things but there's still a lot I'm learning and I hope that having these discussions like with William and like with uh, an atheist friend of mine that I'll have on and with other pastors and different uh, people in my life that have different perspectives on religion and Israel and all these different topics, it's going to really help myself grow. And I hope it also helps you guys out there grow in your faith. And I hope asking these questions are going to make you try to figure out these answers yourself. And I want to make sure that you guys are going to the scripture to look for these answers. Because fundamentally, the scripture is where the truth is. Obviously, John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So that word is 
the truth if you believe that Christianity is right, then you believe that the word is the truth. So where else do you look but the truth, which would be looking at the word for these answers? So although talking about these things help kind of put it in a different perspective than how you're reading it, I want to make sure that we're always grabbing scriptures throughout the podcast. So I'm making sure that I'm sticking to the truth. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, that's a a really good discussion. And obviously I'm going to have you on a later episode uh, and we'll have another topic to talk about. I'm really excited you're starting your own podcast about Christian apologetics. Uh, And I really hope in the future that God blesses you just as much as you have blessed me. Having you in my life has helped me grow. Just like you mentioned, it's like having your ideas be exposed to the world. That helps you grow. And you've done that for me by having someone to talk to you about these things. And so I really appreciate that. Um, no if problem. If there's anything that I would say Justin and me disagree on the most, it's probably that he thinks pineapple tastes good on pizza. I think that's objectively not true. Are and you if there's serious, anything that's man? hurt our relationship, You're bringing this up as much as anything has, it's definitely that right there. Um, so okay, it's the sweetness of the pineapple. You're following me, right? The saltiness of the cheese and the savoriness of the ham. Sweet does it's not sweet, go good with savory. Sweet, salty, and savory, dude. No, it you works. Don't, it just sweet works. Sweet does not go good with savory. You don't put sweetness on meat it doesn't work really honey garlic chicken wings shut up okay all right well, that's, <laughs> it for, uh, that's it for now all right that was good i really appreciate having you on william and uh we'll catch you guys next week all right that concludes our podcast for today well i had a really great discussion with one of my closest friends william uh, make sure that you guys check out our facebook page called the disciples defense you'll find any other information regarding my podcast there as well as our website, our Patreon, and any other discussion and information that you guys might need regarding our podcast. So, not every battle is easy. But one thing I know for sure is that the king is on his throne. Bye-bye for now.